Um, I, I don't know how old you are. Would you? Uh, Sixty-seven. Would you mind telling me? Um, are you even in your most private personal moments absolutely convinced that when you know the day arrives and you're facing mortality that your convictions will be as strong on that day as they are today that there is no god do you leave any space for the for the possibility that you're wrong and on the day you die you find out that you're wrong well uh, i can't prognosticate how I will feel. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll be senile and gaga. I, 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 I may you know, be converted to religion for those reasons. Um, I certainly hope not. And I, and, and I certainly intend to have a tape recorder switched on so that nobody can falsely allege that I had a deathbed uh, conversion. Uh -huh. um, now, it, as, as to the question of, I mean, I, I've already said I'm not convinced of anything. I mean, I can't say categorically. Well, you're 6.5. Uh, 6.5. On the scale, um, convinced. I can't, I can't say categorically that there is no life after death. Uh, it seems to me to be very implausible because everything that we understand about the way minds work suggests that they're bound up with brains. Minds work suggests that they're bound up with brains. And brains don't survive death. Uh, everything we, that we know suggests that brains evolve gradually over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, getting more and more complex. And so worms have brains, but probably not, not consciousness. Um, as evolution progressed, you have animals that become, have, probably have a sort of rudimentary consciousness, maybe shrews and mice have a sort of rudimentary mm -hmm. consciousness. Um, this all evolved by gradual degrees over hundreds of millions of years in brains as brains got bigger and bigger. Now, that doesn't seem to me to ring plausible to say <coughs> when your brain dies, your consciousness goes on. I mean, where was it in all that, those evolutionary eons in the past? I, I it just doesn't ring plausible. I hear your argument on that, and I understand your argument. I guess what I'm asking is, are you 6.5 on the scale, believing that you will be as convinced or almost as convinced as you are today in the moment when when it's all going to end and you face whatever it is that comes after, if it's nothing or if it's something. I've already said that I might be gaga. If, if I were condemned to death today uh -huh. in, in, in my present, with my present mental faculties, 6.5, just about, more, probably more than 6.5, 6.9. The phone's to Jason in Monticello. Jason, can you make it quick? Yeah, uh, could you please talk about the irreducible complexity argument for a uh, designer of the universe? All right. Uh, the ir irreducible complexity argument, the phrase was coined about uh, 10 years ago. Um, the argument itself goes back a long, long way. It goes back to um, before Darwin, as a matter of fact. Darwin answered it. Um, if there really was an irreducibly complex thing, then you want to ask two, two questions. Ir irreducibly complex means if you take away one bit of it, the whole thing collapses like a house of cards and it won't work. So the argument is that if you have find an, and it's been said that, for example, eyes are irreducibly complex or mm -hmm. the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex. Um, one meaning of that is that if you take away one brick from the entire edifice, the whole thing collapses. And so it couldn't have evolved by gradual degrees. Now, that, that is false because you can have scaffolding that is there to build the thing up. And once it's build up, built up, you can take the scaffolding away. And so then it becomes irreducibly complex in the sense that if you remove one brick, it all collapses. But it doesn't mean that it couldn't have evolved uh, gradually. That's the first point. Second point is that some of the alleged irreducibly complex things, such as bacterial flagellum, just simply the man who suggested it was, didn't, didn't, didn't know enough. And, and modern work has shown that actually there are antecedents to the bacterial flagellum. But uh, the third point is that most of the, is, is that he simply argues by assertion. Simply he asserts that something is irreducibly complex. You can't just assert something like that without qualification, without evidence, without substantiation. Yet that's what he does. Ever since Darwin, we've been fighting off claims that this is irreducibly complex or that is irreducibly complex. And it turns out that the, the claims are made by people who are just ignorant. We haven't talked about Darwin as much as I wanted to, and we, we're almost out of time, so we'll do that then when your next book comes out. But I, I do want to ask you about that in the moments that we have left. Uh, the new book is going to be called The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. Um, why do we need a book like that? I mean, I mean, 
there's Why a lot do we of, need it? Well, I mean, there's a lot of scientific <laughs> theory out there, especially in this year that we're celebrating the publication of of the anniversary here of Darwin's on origins. Forty percent of the American public believes that the world is only six thousand years old. They're going to be persuaded by your by your book. Who knows? I mean, it's, haven't you given up on on, the, on those given, people? I most certainly have not given up. Why not? Um, well, because. There are a few dyed in the wool people who, will, who will, will not bother to read it, but there are many, many people who haven't really thought about it very much. Come back to really the first conversation we were having. Mm -hmm. Many, many people who uh, vaguely think, oh, didn't God do it? Oh, yeah, I seem to remember it. Doesn't it say in Genesis? Um, those are the people I want to reach. There, there are certain people whose mind you'll never change, of course, but there are plenty of people who just haven't thought about it very much. And it's very interesting. I mean, the evidence is fascinating. It's detailed. It's highly detailed. It's highly persuasive. It's massive, and it's well worth writing any number of books on it. Is the preface going to say, if you're a creationist, I'll make you an evolutionist by the time you put this book down, you're or have really you learned your lesson? <laughs> really well, I, I, I don't apologize for that, for that <laughs> preface at all. It's, it's perfectly legitimate to express your, your, your greatest hope, your wildest dream, uh, while at the same time admitting that your practical hopes are a, a little bit less. The God delusion has sold more than a million and a half copies. It's influenced an enormous number of people. I get thanked over and over again by people saying that I, I, I have helped them to come out and say what they really think. Um, and uh, I, I, th th this new book is about evolution. It's not about God, but I hope the same thing will be true of that too. Come back and talk about it, will you? I'd love to. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Richard Dawkins speaking tonight at 7 o'clock at Northrop Auditorium at the University of Minnesota. And again, the book that comes out in the fall, we'll talk about it then. The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. Coming up now at 10 o'clock, we are talking about the Minnesota state budget. Some numbers crunching going on over there at the state capitol. We'll have two of the most powerful politicians in the House, in the studio here, uh, who I suspect will have a bit of a disagreement about how to close that gap. And so that's what we're talking about today at 10. I'll be asking you for your ideas as they debate whether to raise taxes, cut taxes for businesses and all the other ideas that are floating around out there. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, she's been called an eco-warrior and the Rosa Parks of the green jobs movement, Majora Carter is gonna be in the studio. It should be a fascinating conversation. Her life story, Really interesting how she came back to her neighborhood in the South Bronx and saw the environmental degradation and basically with no experience created a green renaissance and then took that global. She'll be in the studio tomorrow morning at 9. I hope you'll be here too. This is Mid Morning. My name is James Sorensen. I'm from Miami. Uh,